This video is part of the Public Health to Data Science Rebrand Program. All right, hello and welcome everybody to today's workshop. And actually, let me share my screen so we can see the um, what we're talking about, which is how to find data for portfolio projects. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. I'm gonna be talking about um, strategies and then I, I'm gonna be demonstrating strategies and then we're gonna take time to do those strategies and then see what we found, all right? So, um, so of course this changes every minute, this presentation, like ever since I started um, trying to find data on the internet, you know, um, everything changed. Like when I first started trying to find data on the internet, you know, like the internet was invented and you couldn't, First, there weren't any search engines. So finally they invented search engines, but you couldn't really like search a database. You know how like you log online and you go to your bank and you look up your, um, like, like, you know, what, what your account's going. Well, you couldn't do that. So if there were, if you couldn't do that, then how are you gonna get data, right? So one of the first things I started looking for was I knew back in the nineties that you could request data tapes from the CDC with study data on them. I knew you could request data from Medicaid. I knew about these things, you know. So I started looking like, is there a place to download it online? You know, well, fast forward, things have really changed. Um, and, and so now I've sort of boiled it down to three general strategies and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So the focus of today's workshop is how to find data on the internet that you can use for portfolio projects, meaning you can use this data on the internet, you know, from the internet, and you can do a project in it and you can post it on WordPress or something, and it, it'll look good for you and it won't get you in trouble and it won't be a bad idea, right? Um, but it, it's not really that easy to do. So I'm going to show you my strategies. Um, and one of the things that you want to do is budget a lot of time because you're going to go down some rabbit holes, so to speak, because even well-documented data, it's hard to sort of shop for it. So you'll see it's very time consuming. Um, but uh, also sometimes you don't find what you want, but you find information that you, you find the raw information that you could turn into data. And so I'm going to explain what happens if you, what you can do if you do that. And then mainly what's really important is if you're like planning for your like master's thesis or dissertation, or you're going to write a, a paper and it's not going to go away. It's a long-term plan. You've got, you've got to like sort of keep track of what you find and what you choose not to use. Cause you're going to keep finding it again. If you don't um, write down, well, why didn't I use this or what is this? And also sometimes the same data set can be hosted on multiple platforms. So you want to make sure that um, just because you're searching in a different place and you find a data set, it's not the same one you found before and you didn't want. All right, so let's see here. So the first thing you wanna do for your portfolio project is decide roughly um, what kind of data you wanna use. And uh, Mika's here, and we had talked about using what we're calling pharmacy claims data, okay? And I'll get a little into that why I'm saying pharmacy claims. Um, what um beth what we wanted beth to use and i'm gonna i'm you know she'll probably watch this and i'm gonna sort of try to look for her today if i have time is beth is analyzing concentrations of some viruses in wastewater data now if you think about wastewater wastewater is not a person right so it doesn't have phi so i was thinking okay i mean what beth's challenged with is that um Wastewater data has a lot of continuous variables in it. And, you know, in epidemiology, we don't always use continuous variables. And then also wastewater data has all this correlated variables. So it's almost the same as if you take someone's labs or a whole bunch of people's labs, you do a complete metabolic panel, all their labs are going to be correlated. Like sick people are going to have bad labs and healthy people are going to have good labs. So wastewater you know, contaminated wastewater is going to have a lot of virus, all different viruses, high concentration, and not so contaminated wastewater is going to be 
um, have less of it. So what we, uh, you know, she's working out that at her work. So I was like thinking, okay, if I found a data set for Beth, I'd want one with a bunch of continuous variables that are probably correlated. And I'd really want it to be about wastewater. But if it wasn't about wastewater, it could be kind of similar so I could have these continuous variables so we could practice that. So that's how you kind of want to think about portfolio projects. Or let's say that Beth doesn't find or we don't find wastewater data, but we find data about wastewater, like not exactly the same data, but something that would inform whatever she's doing. Then maybe she should shift her portfolio project to that data set. We'll, we'll just see. So what I so what I just talked about with Beth was her scenario, and then I talked a little about data set requirements. Okay, and so um, I I made a scenario on the slide. This is sort of a half true scenario. I have a customer who's interested in this topic, so I decided to make a scenario around it. So imagine that Abe is a nurse and he is concerned about his patients with type two diabetes, and he's in the U.S. and he's concerned that those with severe cases. Um, are not able to access injectable insulin they need due to shortages in the US. So imagine Abe is a nurse who's interested in informatics and he wants to do a project around this topic. Um, he's probably thinking, like imagining about getting encounter data or data about individuals um, and insulin and type two diabetes. But the reality is, is it might not be very easy for him to find that, so maybe he can adjust his question or do something slightly different so he can still do a project on the topic and maybe use a different data set. So, um, I, so I wrote these data set requirements for Abe. So these, the reason why I have these here is like, when you go shopping for data, you end up really going down the rabbit hole because you have to like read a lot about the data set to decide if it's what you really want. And sometimes you sort of are like, well, okay, is it what I want? And it's nice to be able to look back at the requirements you wrote down. Um, and you can change your requirements, like you can change your project. Um, you may change your project if you find like data you want or or you just figure something out from this experience. But um, in the beginning, it's good to just set up these uh, data set requirements so that as you go down the rabbit hole, you can look back at them and just see what you were thinking. So for Abe, I wrote down, it must pertain to type two diabetics in the US who use insulin. That's who he's worried about, okay? And it must provide insight into how insulin shortages may affect these individuals. Now, that could, we at all love it if there was a question on a survey or something about that, but what probably, we would have to do is look at um like a cross-sectional analysis if you were able to find the data like you know the people who say that they ha need insulin do they have other like attributes that suggest that maybe a shortage is happening with them you know what i mean like you'd have to be kind of proxy about it um so that's a second requirement um and then the third is the more recent the better but that's not so much a requirement and you'll find that that is, can be an issue, is recency of data available. All right. So when you're writing requirements for a data set for your portfolio project, like those three I just said, you don't really need a lot of them. But it makes sense to do it because you'll find a lot of data that kind of almost meets your requirements, but not quite. And then you want to ask yourself, do I change what I'm doing? You know, because it's not like you're in a class with homework and you have to do this and, you know, answer these questions. And it's also not like you're at work if you're just doing a portfolio project at home. You know, it, it, you can just do something else just so you can get a project done and, and sink your teeth into the topic. And so sometimes, sometimes you have to sort of adjust what you're going to do just to be fastidious or to get going on it. Um, so an example is like, let's say you think you want encounter or claims data. So that's data from like uh, clinical settings. And sometimes you can get it, you know, some de-identified data sets exist, but a lot of them, you know, don't, <laughs> or if they exist, like what's in them and like, um, 
what part of the encounter do you need really of the data set? Or like if it's hospital discharge data, that's a really good example. Like we were talking um, about HCUP that they have a, a hospital discharge data set. But what a lot of people don't do before they approach that, net, that hospital discharge data set, and how I know this is I counsel them. Like they'll be like, I want it. And I'm like, okay, I need you to sit down and just have a fantasy with me. Okay. All of the people in this data set actually got admitted to the hospital. So I want you to just sit and think about that. Like what happens if all these people got admitted in at different times in the past, you know? And so there's sometimes they start going, oh, wait a second, you're right. This is all of these people were just in the hospital for some period of time. And this is their discharge data. And what they realize is because um, they might want to know like, certain things that happened along the way during the hospital say maybe that data is not exactly there <laughs> maybe it's more like what it looks like when they're ready to leave and so um so sometimes when you sit down and you think of like well what do i really need for what you know project i was thinking of doing you know what exact variables maybe they're not even in the data set you were thinking of um so one of the things um because mika was going to look at pharmacy claim data one thing you and I had done, Mika, before is I had gone out on the internet to try and just find you some pharmacy claims data. And um, I had found um, this thing. Uh, this was the one from New Hampshire. So New Hampshire, state of New Hampshire had this guide posted um, for Medicare Part D prescription drug event data, which is like pharmacy encounter data. So why did I go steal uh, New Hampshire? It's because, and, and this is kind of old, and it's not very long. It's because I thought I could see a data dictionary in there, right? And uh, and I'll show you the data dictionary. Um, it's kind of like a data dictionary because I don't work with um, pharmacy claims data. So I didn't know exactly what was in there, but it, it kind of makes sense. So. I'm gonna go through some of these elements because they're in like all encounter data. Like you're always gonna have a beneficiary ID. Why are you always gonna have that? Well, the word beneficiary means the person has insurance. Like that's the ID of their, it's like an insurance ID. And then here's the plan ID. This has to do, okay. Now this prescriber ID. So let's say that um, we're talking about New Hampshire not everybody can prescribe drugs in new hampshire right like not even every clinician like only certain people are approved to do that you know by their licensing by the state of new hampshire so when they're licensed they are assigned an id now i don't know about this particular data set if you download that and you get a prescriber id it might not be like a real prescriber like if this is a data set on the internet it might be like a uh a number that would never, you could not look it up and you could not figure out who that person is. But if data sets are prepared for analysis on the internet, which I'll be showing you in a second, what they'll sometimes do is make it so you, you can find out about this prescriber ID. For example, is this a cardiologist? Is this a pain management person? Is this a, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Um, but I, I, pretty sure that if they give out any data like this like for analysis that they make it so you can't tell who that is definitely you would be able to tell who these people are but it's important to have these ids so you can link things up across like you'd be able to link the same beneficiaries claims and then um the pharmacy id which is where it was dispensed and again you know this might not be redacted, the pharmacy ID. I'm not sure, you know, it depends on the state or who's preparing the data set. But this might also be like um, prescriber ID in that it might be redacted, but it might, you know, crosswalk to some categories like retail pharmacy, hospital pharmacy or whatever. Um, and again, like I'm just looking at this, I'm, I'm sure there's pick lists and stuff I'm not looking at. But the reason why I went over these ideas is I think if you were going to do any analysis of pharmacy claims, like let's say I was asked a question like, um, what drugs do cardiologists prescribe the most in New Hampshire? And I was using this data set. 
if I asked that question, I'd probably need all of these. You know, I'd, I'd want to know if the beneficiary, how many beneficiary, like if there's a cardiologist and this beneficiary, how many they were, you know, filling per person. So I, you usually want IDs. But then after that, do I really want everything here? Like the data service, you know, the thing Meek and I were talking about doing is this thing called topic modeling, which is where you take a whole bunch of like a corpus of data and you can sort it into um, categories, like how, how it, you know, co-occurring categories. And it's, it's a language model. And, and, um, and it had been applied in this article using the drug name, basically. I, I think it would be this drug information, product service identifier, drugs coverage, status code, quantity dispensed, day supply. And this looks like it's a, like this huge long um, string. That's, um, that's the way I see it here. And so I would kind of imagine that the topic modeling is based on this, this um, variable. And you can break in Mika if you know more about data like this than I do. Um, and this is other stuff, uh, but then the, you've got drug costs. So let's say I'm talking about topic modeling. We don't care what it costs, you know, and we don't even really care about dates. We don't care um, about payment. <laughs> we don't care about that. A catastrophic coverage indicator. I'm pretty sure we don't care about that. So you start to see that most of the stated dictionary we don't care about if we wanted to do topic modeling of drugs, right? So that already makes it so like, well, maybe maybe I can just find a, a list of like the drugs that were being prescribed, or maybe I can find some sort of similar data um, that isn't the whole claim. So that's sort of what I was saying is that you want to sort of sit down with your question or what you're trying to do. If you find, um, like for instance, when I, let's say I wa wanted to make an upset plot, like a lot of you have seen my blog about that, is when you have an upset plot, you have a lot of, you, you have these entities that have a lot of patterns, like, like this person, do they have diabetes? Do they have car cardiovascular disease? Do they have arthritis? Do they have, you know, what are those patterns, right? And, um, and let's say you had a uh, clinical data set. Well, you know why you could reduce that data set to a whole bunch of ones and zeros, like, you know, like, and you could just make a study ID and you could just sample a hundred people and put ones and zeros. And suddenly it's not even clinical data anymore, really. You know what I mean? It's not HIPAA data, it's not anything. And then you can visualize it, right? And so that's what I'm saying is sometimes, sometimes in data science, if you're like trying to practice a package or something, maybe you don't even really need the whole data set. Obviously, if you're trying to answer a question about real live data, like like you're you work on a production database and you're trying to like improve the IO or whatever, you know, this wouldn't work. But if you're just trying to get used to using a package or doing a certain um process, then you can kind of cheat and find um just focus on the part of the data set you want for that exercise and try to find that and just use that. All right. So, um, so any questions before I move on, Mika? So did, well, have you, uh, let me just ask you, have you looked at any, um, have you looked for any data or not? I did. You did? Yeah. Actually, did I found that the CMS, so the uh, prescribe drug data. For what public use. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's let's actually. I was going to go to CMS. So when I get to the CMS one, I'll call on you and we'll go and look at what you did. Like you can tell okay. me what to do. All right. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Good job. Okay. So now today it's 2023, and today this is my three main approaches, and they not they aren't sort of like mutually exclusive, um, but they are kind. They're kind of like a gradation. So. One is shop for data. And by shop for data, I mean, look in official data repositories. And like we were just mentioning um, CMS, that's, I would classify that as an official data repository. We'll talk more about what is official data repository and what's like just data on the internet, you know, because two is more like just data on the internet. So hustle for data. So that's looking for data sets available on the internet that are not part of a repository. 
but these may require getting permission. And these aren't like hustle for data is not like you necessarily find the data and you can just download it, right? Like if you find data in a repository, usually you can just download it. Or if you need to get to permission, you just fill out a form and click something and then download it. Like you don't have to apply and get approved or anything. But under my hustle for data, I put I put that where you you really are finding like maybe um like a unique data set that's hosted by a particular society or a particular organization um, that they make available, but you've got to uh, get approved or whatever, right? And then um, finally, the last one is make your own data. And I don't really mean like do a survey or like go through the IRB and do data collection like we do in like epidemiology. What I mean by make your own data is either you collect data off of the internet, like uh, off of like websites. Like for instance, once I was thinking of doing a project, I was wondering about public health budgets for the different states. And I thought, well, I could, I, I noticed that there were some states that had their public health budget online. And I thought, oh, well, you know, you could just collect data. I mean, N equals like 50 or so. You could just collect data off of that into a spreadsheet and do an analysis, see, see what you could find. Um, but you know, like, like it was just a thought, um, but that's not, um, that's more like data abstraction. So we'll talk about that. And then the, uh, then, but what data scientists usually do when they want data off of the internet and it's not available is that they scrape it. So we'll talk a little bit about the options for scraping and, you know, how that can fit into your portfolio. All right. All right, so the first one we're gonna to try to do is shop for data in repositories. So shopping for data in repositories is um, pretty easy because the repositories are well organized and they have search engines and their data sets are classified. Now, <clears throat> when they first started inventing these repositories, I was really skeptical about it because I ran a lot of databases. So imagine you get a grant and you do data collection for a traditional like epidemiologic study. What you end up with at the end is you end up with usually a data set kind of like in SAS format. And it's like an official analytic data set for the um, study. And it's usually sitting on some biostatisticians like a PC or somewhere out on, on a server somewhere. So I remember I would I would observe that and I think, well, why aren't we sharing this? Why can't we, you know, easily share the study, you know? But I hadn't really thought that for, far ahead, you know, um, if you really want to share data from that study, it's a lot of work because you've got to get the protocol together. You got to get the study forms like you don't want somebody just downloading that data and not really knowing, you know, what happened. Right. So what happened was when these repositories set up, they set up um, rules about when you add data to the repository, you know, that you have to add certain documentation. It's very similar to like if you make an R package and you add it to the CRAN server, you have to follow these rules. Right. Because that way, you know, they keep the quality up. Now, I remember I had a customer who had found an R package that was not on the CRAN server, but we used it anyway. And I realized why it wasn't on the CRAN server is because it was doing something that's not statistically correct, right? I even found a paper about exactly that little application. So there's a reason to go to the repository because first of all, you know the provenance of the data. Like you really know it really was from the CDC or really is from, you know, whatever government put there, put it there. Usually it's governments or it's universities. Um, and these repositories are made for analysts to just be able to download the data and, um, and use it. But the problem is much of the data are not very useful um, for various reasons, mainly because other people have already used them. But if you think about it, the hypothetical I gave you where, oh, we did this clinical trial and I have this nice data set. Well, don't you think all my friends on the clinical trial have already written all the papers about it? So if you're like going, okay, well, 
if they're doing scientific research, yeah, there's probably no other answers. But if all you're trying to do is like visualize patient data or come up with like a patient data dashboard or something, maybe the data is just fine. You know, it's real life data that you can just use for display. So it really matters what project, what kind of project you're trying to do um, with it. All right, so let's see here. So I put two on the slide, the ICPSR, which actually stands for something, but they're like KFC, like, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, like it used to call it that, now it's just KFC. And you're not supposed to remember it's Kentucky Fried Chicken. And ICPSR used to mean something, but um, you're not supposed to know anymore, which is good because I can't remember. Um, below that, I've got the CDC. This is like the National Center for Health Statistics, but that's kind of complicated too. Um, so I was going to show you about um, shopping for data and the ICPSR. Um, oh, just one thing I want to say is it's very hard to run these repositories, okay? It's very labor intensive and, you, 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 you know, it's a lot of work to serve data. The problem is I, I, I think that there's not much of a business model in it. This one that we're going to hear, the ICPSR, is from the University of Michigan. And, um, and you know, these other three, these two are um, government ones, and I'll show you what this is. This, this is kind of a weird one. Maybe even Mika knows more than I do about it. Um, but here we go. Okay, so at first, you know, whenever I get to this web page, I always swoon because it looks like there's so much data, right? You can go find data, and we'll go find data, right? So um, I'm gonna sort of show you how I would approach Abe's problem. So remember Abe is wanting to find data sets about the US, about people with type two diabetes that is so severe that they're using insulin and any sort of information about maybe insulin shortages or trouble getting insulin. So, you know, let's say I do diabetes and maybe United States. Okay. So I get a lot of studies and what's kind of interesting is they have these sort of coded by variables. Like they've done a lot of, um, a lot of work to make it easy for me to shop for data. Um, but nevertheless, like you can see that these are really old data sets, like really old. Um, but here, here, text message outreach for complex patients with diabetes in Denver. Well, think about it. Maybe that's, um, and that's only in 2011, 2012, which is, you know, kind of a long time ago, but not so bad. And Denver is in um, the US. And this looks like just a group of people who did a study and they post their data set. And I, I believe that if you write a grant to do, and you include the grant funding so you can get your data together and post it here, maybe that's how they were able to afford that because that's not trivial, right? So we'll go to this data set and just see if maybe there's some, um, we can figure out, even if we could just figure out who in the data set needed injectable insulin and any other variables about them. So I don't know, I'll click on this variables here and let's just see what we got here. Okay, uh, it looks like they don't have their variables set up. Sometimes they do um, because I've, I've been clicking around here. Um, so they, they just didn't um, add that. Let's do data and documentation. Um, so here you can download. So let's download this data dictionary, okay? Okay, so now that I'm actually doing this, I'm getting this zip file. I'm feeling like I, I want to keep track of this, okay? Because I'm actually looking at it. So I'm gonna go over here. So this is gonna be, I'm gonna just copy this over here. So we'll say, so this is Abe. Okay, so this is, I'm going to copy this here. And then, um, and what I did was, so when you copy from the internet, um, you know, from my previous stuff uh, with HTML and stuff, it, it be, it's really ugly. Like, for example, let's say I just copy this and I, and I just do paste. Look at how ugly that is. Like it's carrying all of that information. I'm going to undo, but if, if you do this, if you go up to paste and then you choose this A one, which is, um, 
that's uh, where it strips all of, it's basically paste special unformatted text, I guess. See that? And then it doesn't do that. So that's what I'm doing there, if you're curious. So um, so I've got that. So when I copy from the internet, I'm like that. So now I'm going to cop I'm going to copy this. I'm not even going to bother to say that it's ISPSR because I can kind of see that from the thing. OK, so now I've just downloaded a data dictionary. So where did that data dictionary go? Here. Oh, look, it's only four pages. Um, let's see your view. Let's see your page fit fit with. OK, so as you can see, this was kind of like their standard stuff that they had to to create with this. Um, and we'll see here. OK, so this is the data dictionary. Now, if you notice, like, this isn't very easy. Like, we're probably going to have to read a lot more about this to be able to see it. So let's see here. I'm just going to do insulin. OK, that's not there. Okay, subject on time date. You know, what I'm looking at this is, it looks like they don't really have that much information about the actual participant. Like they said culture here. I don't know if that's like a throw culture or what. And it says gender and age, but it really doesn't have anything about them, really. Um, okay, so... Uh, so I already have this. I might as well save it. Remember, it was in that zip file. So I'm going to here put this. Um, I had a one page data dictionary and did not say much about insulin or did not say anything about insulin or much about patients. Okay, so that one was no good. So you can see how like each time I get to something, it's going to be like kind of like this, right? So you, but you start to iterate, you start to get better at it. Like, um, like I was attracted to that because it was sort of recent. Um, then this United States renal data system that I think that those people might be too sick. Let's see here. Census tract classification. No. Um, Companion files for racial differences in patient experience and diabetes management outcomes among reproductive age women. So we don't know um, even if this is in the U.S., but let's just take a look at it. Um, so they have these papers, and it's like if you read the paper and you can tell like for example, like this um, patient experiences. Sometimes you can tell from reading the paper um, what data they have. So this is from the medical experience. Uh, no, this looks really complicated. And on the top of that, so this mm -hmm. might be focused on the gestation Diabetes. Oh, yeah, you're right. It might be gestational diabetes. So we'll put this here and say, um, good call. Yeah, that's another problem is, and I don't know enough about gestational diabetes to know about if you ever end up injecting insulin, right? So let's see here and we'll say, oh, no, nah. let's see here, confusing probably about gestational diabetes <laughs> okay so we don't want that um what i want to show you is like um there are ones that i found that are it's your national study this see how the how like here if it's the united states let's see here let's try this um these are really old but i want to show you one where they've really filled it out like here i think let's see here no, they didn't fill this out. There's somewhere they filled it out. Let me see if I do insulin. I don't know if that'll help or not. Um, well, here, maybe multiple cause. I mean, this is 2005, but let's see if their variables are in here. Uh, <laughs> is nothing happening? Okay, here's data and documentation. 
Okay, and variables. I guess it's loading. I was going to fast here. So I'm surprised that I click on variables and it's loading like that. But what that suggests to me is that there's an I.O. problem. And the, what suggests that suggests to me, an I.O. Pro, pro problem loading this, like this is literally no data, right? If you think about your bank account. And whenever I see an I.O. problem like that loading data, I think SAS is the back end of this dashboard. And that's always a problem because that means you've got a non-relational back end and it's going to be hard to shop in this data. So see this act age recode 12, age recode 27. Age, these kind of things are what you get when you have a flat, flat databases. You get a whole bunch of like empty variables. And so that's another problem with ICPSR and a lot of these is that they've got these flat, ugly um, data sets. Although I do want to um, show you what it looks like when it's actually filled out. Let's see. Oh, yeah, we did. these Yeah, that's, those variables are not. Like I saw some small ones. Oh, bringing, building infrastructure for comparative bicep. Let's see what that is. That's cute. Okay, let's see your variables. Um, primary language. Study ID, primary and set uh platelets immunosuppressants well it looks like uh hey it looks like maybe we know uh here like there's some pretty good diabetes well this looks pretty good well let's figure out what it's about huh um and a glance what this is the primary was to advance analytical of observational with multiple okay in adults with type 2 diabetes mellitus coupled with additional chronic diseases. Okay, these are sick people. What is the comparative effectiveness of T2DM medications in achieving glycemic control? Was the comparative effectiveness effectiveness um, differ across subgroups based on demographic complex comorbidities, other types? So this suggests that we'd have maybe some data in here. Um, let's see if they filled in the variables. Um, Oh yeah, here. Yeah, this looks pretty good. So this was one that I would actually look into more. So I'm going to actually do that um, later during the workshop, and I'll I'll, um, I'll report back. I'll see if I could find a data set for Abe or something that Abe can do with this, or um, we'll decide it's no good. All right. Um, all right. So. Hopefully, um, so so hopefully, what you found is even though um, what you see from ICPSR is even though it's a really good um, platform, it's got a lot of data on it. It's got a lot of stuff that you could probably use in a portfolio project, depending on what we're trying to do, and it's really organized. It still is very tedious to go shopping through it and keeping track of everything you found and deciding what you're going to do. You might end up going back to some data sets you looked at and someday and like saying, okay, maybe I'll use one of these or one of those. But it's nice to know about the data that's out there. Now, I always am. So the ICPSR is at the University of Michigan. So what does that mean? Whenever something is at like a um, like an institution, like a university or something, it means that there are people there who really care about that project and they really, it's their pet project. But if you're, if like here, this is the C CDC and this is CMS, that's the government. So when the government's hosting a platform, it's more like this is part of its job. So, uh, and, and that's not to say that you don't have some really good platforms um, from the government, like VRFSS has a lot of really good documentation, but it's just, often the the institutions who are hosting it they have a certain level of pride in it and so so i i just found this public use data files and documentation and this was not very easy to use um this was more like a bunch of pointers to like here if you go to n haynes i'm a little familiar with n haynes and this is a, a surveillance data set but it's super fragmented. Let's see if it's still fragmented. Yeah. So let's say you wanted to analyze this data. 
let's say, you know, we were talking about lab data. Let's say that we wanted to download the lab data. Actually, I, there, it's probably available from, you know, <laughs> that's funny to pre-pandemic. They're so pragmatic. Um, but anyway, so let's say that you wanted to take the lab data, you know, here. So each person who was in NHANES got this test done to them, right? Well, not every single one. Each one of them that uh, that um, participated in the lab part, right? So this could be data that you could download, just this lab data. If you didn't care whose labs these were, you could just use it to make scatter plots and stuff. But normally, you actually care whose labs they are. And so you would have to connect the lab data with the demographic data to figure out like the, the race of everybody. And if you wanted to see, like I'm seeing this albumin and creatinine, like this is bad. Like if you've got albumin and creatinine in your urine, it's like probably having kidney problems. So I would wanna know about maybe dietary data or whatever, but the problem is once you go and you, you hook all these together, all the people didn't participate in it. And you end up with these really small data sets, like some of them that gave the labs, you know, they don't have the information about diet. It's so frustrating. So that was like the CDC one is basically another rabbit hole. So you have to go and study all these data sets. Um, and again, I'm concentrating on like health data because that's what we do. But you can, you know, find other data out there like that. Um, and then CMS, this, so when Obama was president is when a lot of this administrative data got, their rules were created that you have to have it available and you have to have places like this. And, you know, I went on here and I did explore data. Let's see here, pharmacy, whoops, I better spell it right. Sorry, no matches. So uh, Mika, maybe you can tell me what you did. Uh, I start. I literally started with Google because uh, Google search because I know CMS is uh, sort of like a maze. Their website is always big maze to me. I didn't mm -hmm. want to spend. <laughs> okay, no, that sounds like. And actually, I'm going to show you something. So Google tells you if you say pharmacy claims data. Let's say I do that. You can do site equals cms.gov. I don't know if that's really going to help, but it, it's supposed to be. Yeah, so the so in case close. of a CMS, that's a part D. Part D. So this part D claims data, maybe that's what it looks like. I it's, Is this where you went? Let's see here. Part D claims data. So this downloads are PDFs, right? Like these aren't actual data. Yeah, oh. actually, so they, if you go to that route, it eventually you ended up to go to that rest yeah, actually, I found I found this ResDAC. You know, ResDAC was at our place at the University of Minnesota. Do you remember that? No, I don't. But usually they ask that yeah, permissions and permissions and agreement and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So I don't particularly like it because it's cumbersome. So cumbersome to just go through, navigate through yeah, the see that? work. So there is another version of CMS data called public use data. Basic I can share my screen if you like. Oh yeah, why don't you do it? And yeah, so that's where the CMS is. Yeah, okay. CMS and uh, initially I got into this page. I see. So so you managed to find like the magic page. Yeah, the public use file. Yeah, they really bury them, don't they? Oh, they they bury it. They don't really come up easily. No, uh, I, I, I. But did you actually get to the point of downloading the data and to make sure it's really that it's really right? Yeah, if you click on, for example, this one and uh, view data. Mm -hmm. and oh, I see. And so, uh, see how it's got um this uh, application where you're supposed to select what you want and then you can export it like which columns uh-huh yeah actually this one is great so they prescribe by an pi that prescribe uh, 
information, their, their name, last organization name, first name, state, uh, state abbreviation. Okay, so let's, let's talk about what you would notice that that's, this is page one of 2,500,000, right? Yeah. So this is where you could start with this. So let's say that this, you know, you wanted to use these data for your portfolio project. What I would do is I would first figure out what are all the column names and figure out what they are and which ones you actually want. Like I'd create a data dictionary mm -hmm. in Excel and I'd figure out all the column names. You might be able to download them or something like that. And I just yeah. put them in or I just put all the column names in order. And you know how I do, I one, two, three, four, five. And then next to it, I would just write notes about whether I wanted it or not, right? And then mm -hmm. after that, it see that filter where it says, or it says manage columns and filters. So this is my fantasy is manage columns is where you get to pick which columns you want to show, right? So yeah. after I had that data dictionary, I'd go up here and I'd, un, I'd select, unselect the columns and I'd go cherry pick out the columns I wanted yeah. and that would be great. Okay, then the next step is in my data dictionary, I'd say, okay, what rows do I want? Like inclusion, exclusion criteria, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so like we were, um, looking at that uh, Zafari article. So what happened in the Zafari article? Well, they were analyzing claims for the state of New Hampshire. So that would be like prescriber state of you know, on there equals NH, right? NH, mm -hmm. right? So if you wanted to do NH, then you could do that. Or, or you could, you, I would re recommend you choose a state, okay? Yeah. Because it's just regionally, it makes more sense, okay. Now, remember how Zafari said, well, we want to compare the pain management prescribers versus like the cardiology, or I forgot what they said. It wasn't cardiology. It was something else. Um, prescribers. Um, so like here, yeah, prescriber type or whatever. So the problem with this is we don't really have the data dictionary made, right? So let's say you were making your data dictionary and it said prescriber NPI, prescriber last organization name, prescriber first name, um, prescriber city. You'd just be like, okay, well, maybe I don't need the city. I don't care what the city is, right? Mm -hmm. But under prescriber type, you'd be like, oh, what, what are the types? What are the choices, right? Mm -hmm. I see internal medicine, but we're gonna have to do some digging in our data dictionary and figure out what the choices are. So that's where you would go, okay, let's say I'm gonna filter by prescriber type. Um, you can make a, you know, a tab, a pick list tab and figure out what all the values are in there and, and then make a choice to say, okay, I'm gonna just pull in these. Like you put it on your data dictionary, you can always change your mind, right? Now here. Um, yeah, it's great. So the drug brand name, drug generic name. Or yeah, you really did a good job of, of doing this. But one of the things, you know, what I'm basically coaching on is, so this is a little off topic, but it's kind of not off topic, okay? The government doesn't want you to have its data, okay? So what, what, am, what do I mean? I, I mean, all over the world, right now there's this movement towards especially democracies passing laws that governments have to open their data. So there's laws being passed in the Netherlands and laws being passed in the UK and laws being passed in the United States where the government's supposed to open its data, make data public, right? Well, there are two main complaints, this is evidence-based, from the um, government for making it public. The first complaint is it's too much work, although, and you kind of have to agree with them because this is, portal is amazing, right? And it was a lot of work. But the second thing that they say is something very annoying. And that is that they don't want oversight. That's basically what they're saying is they don't want you to actually get to the data and analyze it and try to hold the government accountable. So what ends up happening is the government's like, okay, we have to serve up the data by law. Um, so let's do a crappy job. 
Well, then the law comes back and says, you're not allowed to do a crappy job. You have to make it like usually the first response will be, OK, we have the data, but it's in a PDF. No, no, no. You have to make it in Excel. OK, we have it, but, you know, um, it's buried or whatever. And one of the strategies that they've done is to create these portals under the guise of, oh, well, you can pick any data you want to download. You just have to manage the columns and put the filter on. Well, that's going to take you a very long time to sit down with the data dictionary, look at everything and decide what to download, right? Like, wouldn't it be easier if they just gave you a SAS data set and you just throw it in SAS or they gave you, you know, a, a CSV, you just throw it in Python or R, or you just throw it in some profiling program. You know what I'm saying? And so I, on one hand, I really like it that they created this so you could make a data dictionary, so you could write all this down so you could replicate it so you could write a method section but they did make it like as onerous as possible like can you get even more to display per page like can you get <laughs> it to be less than two million pages <laughs> see where it says yeah okay put a hundred that'll help <laughs> then we can see more you know like when we're in in, in that um Okay, well, that didn't work, did it? Oh, no, you, still have, you still have to scroll down. All right. So um, are you getting what I'm saying, Mika, about making this data dictionary where you d decide in the data dictionary what columns you want? And you decide also sort of the inclusion criteria. It's like you write that down. You play with this database and write all that stuff down before you actually set up the manage columns and the filter and do the export. D do you get what I'm saying? Uh, so the, uh, yeah, I can probably select that. So prescribe a state in New Hampshire or uh, California or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but do you get what I'm saying about making a data dictionary? It's like you sit yeah. down and you open it up and you don't know what to say. So you write some stuff down and then you play with the data and then you change your mind. You know how like in BRFSS, they have a code book. So if you look at the state one, it'll say how many are in Illinois and how many are in New Hampshire or whatever. Well, I don't know if there's a code book for this, right? So you're pretty much going to be like, oh, okay, well, let's say I do put a filter on California, like how many are in there? Do I really want California? You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so you're going to have to sort of, I, I would re recommend shopping for columns first mm -hmm. and deciding what columns you even care about. And then after that, and and it's kind of like think do it the way do it the way you do when you're shopping for a dress where you just go grab everything you think is gonna fit and then just go in the dressing room and try everything on once and throw it all out so just grab any um any columns from managed columns that you think or or not grab them but put them in your data data dictionary as like x like i think like this is a candidate column and then when you go to decide the inclusion exclusion criteria, like what rows you're going to accept, what values those columns have to have with, you know, obviously you don't care about prescriber NPI or you don't care about some of those, you know, you don't care what the value is, but you care what the value is of state. And maybe you care, I don't know if you care what the, oh, I see that FIPS code, that's easier. That's the same as the state. It's like 25 is like Massachusetts. It's easier to set the criteria because it's just a number. I just noticed that. Um, but like maybe of county, county has a FIPS code on it too. Uh, you might end up taking like a big county, Los Angeles County. I don't know. But you see what I'm saying is that as you play with the data on this portal and you see what values are in the fields, then you can write down what inclusion and exclusion criteria you really want to apply because we want to keep track of all that because then you'll set it and you'll do that export and you'll grab the data. And if, I don't know, I keep paying my taxes, you probably are paying yours. So this will keep getting updated and you can go and maybe get more data. Like if you ever want to replicate it or whatever. So you get what I'm saying about that data dictionary, like using that to help you nail down your criteria for your columns. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, good job. Great job. Like, what a find. All right. Well, I was going to give us um, an activity to look for a repository, but you already found your repository. So I think we'll just go on with that because you did such a good job. Um, all right. Uh, so 
Uh, so just to, to wrap up that part, um, it can be hard to find a repository. If you find a repository, I was more in a repository, okay? So this thing over here, thank you. Okay, I meant to be showing you this. So see this ghdx.healthdata.org? So what this is, is uh, I, I kind of don't understand it, but it has something to do with the Lancet um, and, and to do with this. This IHME is a think tank, a healthcare think tank at the University of Washington in the US. So something to do with the Lancet journal in um the uk and them and i i was intrigued by this because i thought you could download data from it um so search data this is about like i actually have some trouble understanding what it's about like here these ihme data sets um we are supposed to be able to download let's hear the, maybe this is the tool Okay, let's see why there's yeah, this was a query tool and I could not get I could not figure out how to query this. I had a customer who was from a particular country and in a region of the world and she wanted to compare like like these these um statistics between the surrounding countries in her country and we worked with this for so long and we could not get the data out. And so I'm noticing that this results tool, I, I don't even know how it works. So you'll, you'll end up with situations like that where you just cannot get the data out. Well, I, I won't look, I'll look it up later, but there's some, some of these query tools and they're just so hard to um, use. Now, there's another um, repository I wanna talk about, but it's not one that's very easy to access, okay? And that's the um, military health, system data um the military health system data repository so if you're hanging out with the military like i kind of do you'll have people call it mdr or M mhs and sometimes i call it mds because they get confused or it's kind of like military data system so the reason why it's oh i guess this is the cdc version this military health system data repository thing these the military has been doing that for years, like years, like literally since the 70s and 80s. And part of the reason why it's possible for the military to have done that is military treatment facilities are not the same as, um, you know, like like treatment, like if you're on a base like Fort Bragg and you get sick uh, and you go there, those those places are not like any any of other places uh, in, in the health, US healthcare system. You know, you can't go, you can't just have insurance and go there. I mean, I've been to there because I was at work and we were visiting, we were interviewing people um, at those clinics. I didn't get sick and go to one, but a lot of people get sick and go to them. You know, they're very functional clinics. It's just that what's interesting about them is they don't bill, you know, they, they don't have the usual claims that you get, but they have their own data and that's what's in here. So you can access this data, but you have to um, get permission. And you're probably like, oh my God, how is that? But actually, the, I don't think it's actually that hard to get permission. This data dictionary here is a work of art, okay? And I remember talking, I, I don't know if the same person's working there, but the person who invented this data dictionary, it is a work of art. Um, now, I wouldn't do this modernly because this involves a lot of macros in um, in uh, Excel. See how I I'm enabling the the um, I'm enabling the macros because I know it was made on the military. There's no way. But see here, these are the detail files. See this detail files and reference tables. These are basically the pick lists, and these are the main tables. And um, I'm really familiar with a lot of these data sets. Like there's one called Sitter, which is like an inpatient data set. So, and Sitter is like an ambulatory data set. So let's say I click on the Sitter, it goes right, isn't that beautiful? And then here's this beautiful data dictionary. So the reason why I even bring this up is this, this is like, if you actually did 
do a good job of shopping in that data dictionary. And you really did not need much data from this, especially if you didn't really need identifiers. It might not be that hard to actually get this data and um, do an analysis as long as you wrote a protocol and stuff. So, um, so I did want to bring up the um, health.mil. All right. So, so when you're scrounging around and you're looking for data on the internet, um, like you did, Mika, you did a really good job. Let's say that I'm looking for, oh, well, I'll do, we'll do like with Abe, we'll do like um, diab. One thing I like to do is I like to include the word download. So download um, diabetes. Um, oh, it says diabetes is CSV. Okay. See how um, Google filled that in for me? That made me think, okay, well, a lot of people are doing that. So let me go see. The problem is a lot of times, what I was kind of looking for some of those. I can't find if if they were using insulin or not. Um, let me see here. Or if it comes up for insulin, it's like there's an insulin measurement, but I don't care. I want to know if they're using exogenous insulin. So let's see here. Um, so here, this is University of California, Irvine. So it makes me like wonder, maybe I can just get their data set, right? So um, this data set is from AIM 94, which suggests it's really old. But again, you know, the this doesn't say like regular insulin dose, like, okay, let's see here. Diabetic patient records were obtained from two sources, an automatic electronic recording and paper records. Yeah, and so this isn't, um, you know, very useful. Like, like that's something you could use to like practice an algorithm or put in like a dashboard, but it's not like something that um, you could, you know, really analyze. I found this data world is kind of this new repository, but I don't know if it's any good because it looks like anybody can do anything at data world. Let's see here. Oh, this is the same data set I was just looking at. Um, it says here there are 36 diabetic data sets. Um, well, if anybody watching this, Mika, do you know anything about data world? Yeah, I poked around a little bit. It just, uh, there are lots of things in there and it's harder to find what I need. <laughs> You know, I think it's an aggregator. I think it just trolls around on the internet and copies stuff in automatically. I, th mm -hmm. I think, so you get a lot of that stuff. You know how like, if I go like, um, like I was looking for um, best yarn store in Boston, I'll get stuff like this. I'll get Yelp, the top 10 best stores in Boston. And this is just an aggregator. This is not like, an article in Boston Magazine about the best yarn stores, you know? And that's what I think that this is, is this is an aggregator. So I, I don't know, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, but anyway, so um, so so this, this is the second thing, is where you just scrounge around on the internet and you look for data sets, okay? What are you gonna find? You might find hosted data sets like that one at that University of California, Irvine. You just download it. Or you might find like what you find, what I found at health.mil, where you have to, um, you have to ask for permission. But before you ask, or just like the ResDAC, like we were talking about before, before you ask for permission, you really need to write a little protocol and have a kind of a good plan. Like, what Mika's trying to do with topic modeling is probably well enough planned so that if unluckily she had to request data, she'd have enough to write down a protocol and then um, be able to, you know, make a, a data request and ex explain what what variables she really wanted and which ones she didn't need and, and you know, actually just sign up for that stuff. What, uh, you know, it's funny, like Mika, when you were going to the ResDAC, you're like, oh, you have to file this paperwork, you have to do all that. And that's everybody's response. But one, one of the things that I find sort of interesting is, you know how like you found that awesome um, webpage where you can just select the data and download it? But 
I just told you, you're gonna have to do hundreds of hours of work on the data dictionary before we really know what you're gonna, you know, before you really know what you want and what your data is and what you're gonna download. Well, that's the same work you have to do when you make a data use agreement, right? And so you end up kind of doing the same things. Like ResDAC is just like, like the military, like everywhere else that you have to apply for data. You almost end up doing almost the same things if you actually file the paperwork. So when I explain to people that, then they feel trapped. <laughs> Like you can't get out of it. You just can't get out of the paperwork. And that's why, the reason why you can't get out of the paperwork is because some of the paperwork is just about replicability. It's just about the methods section for whatever, or whatever your methods is going to be. Because you're going to want to be able to tell people, this is where I got my data. You know, this is, this is what I filtered in. This is why, you know, um, and also, in data science projects, sometimes you start by filtering in New Hampshire and trying something, and then you realize like there's something wrong with New Hampshire, like it has no surgeons or something like that. I mean, it obviously has surgeons, but maybe the data doesn't have any surgeons or something like that. And then you end up having to do another thing. And you can write a, a, a blog post about any of these things, you know, that you find because, you know, it's that's what I kind of like about the data science journey is it's more about the journey. Like in science, it's more about the <laughs> the end game <laughs> but in data science is about the journey okay so um so mika any questions before i move on to make your own data um all right so there's so let's say so mika succeeded we've got stuff for her you know i'm gonna help beth look for some stuff for her we're probably gonna find some i i you know i saw some labs in there my my abe friend will look for some stuff for him but sometimes you you can't find what you want or you kind of do find what you want but it's not in the shape you want so the the two choices you have when that happens is data abstraction and data scraping now i'm not including in make your own data interviews or surveys or anything because that's like IRB stuff, right? Like you would have to deal with ethics. Now I have a business. So if I send out a market research survey that says, you know, what classes do you want or what courses do you want me to make or whatever, that's not an IRB thing if I keep it, you know, uh, anonymous. But if you start like actually like doing surveys of how people feel about things, you know, that's an IRB thing. So. So I'm separating that from this. I'm talking about like stuff you can do that's non-IRB, that's not going to be considered human research. And data abstraction is actually the oldest game in the world. It's the game we used to play back in the 80s and 90s. So I, I actually never did an abstraction. Well, I shouldn't say that. I probably have done. I've probably done small ones, but I've never done a big abstraction project. But I remember an abstraction team doing one. So what had happened was, I think it was at a head of a county. There was some question about, I think it was gestational diabetes. Like I, I remember this doctor had kept a list of patients who had gotten gestational diabetes and she was worried about them. And she wanted to do follow-up. So what they did is this list had the patient ID so they could write the protocol and the protocol said that they would look up the patient ID and the data abstractors what they did was they created a form that the data abstractor would fill out and they cre created instructions of where to find the data in the medical record you know they were you know um paper records and they were organized a certain way but where where to look for that data to put in each field and then um you know they were allowed you know on a special day they were allowed into the medical records room and the records had been pulled for them and they sat down with each one and they would fill out that form and then they bring out the forms and then somebody do data entry and turn it into data well how that would change today is like so i'll give you an example of one that i was interested in and this is like about 10 years ago i i was really interested in the difference in the um budgets of the different public health departments in the different states so if you, if you assume 50 states which is not right because there's guam there's other territories and stuff but if you assume 50 states 
you would have like 50 um, experimental units. It's kind of like 50 diabetics, right? That you're abstracting data from. So I realized that most public health departments have their budget online and most have a web page and they have a lot of information about them. So I could structure like a um, like a protocol where I went and I looked up all 50 of these and I gathered data about it. And that would be a nice abstraction project. So I want to make sure everybody understands that abstraction projects on um, in the public domain are really useful. You don't you might not have a lot of N. Like there are not actually that many hospitals in Massachusetts because it's not that big. And so you can do a lot by just visualizing hospitals um, or visualizing even like pharmacies. Uh, you can do like, actually, I'm going to go over here because I just, there's this thing called um, HIPSA, which are health, um, health, what is it? Health provider shortage areas. And there's actually this HIPSA database that you can study. And again, this is not about, it's the experimental unit is not people, it's like territory or state. And this would take a while. I, I was trying to understand, I was helping somebody with something in North Dakota. So I was trying to figure out, well, like um, select counties, I guess all counties. So I was trying to figure out what are these shortage areas, right? And so this is, is it Billings County? I mean, are the whole counties a shortage area? So I would have had to like really kind of study this data before analyzing it. But you you can and and like if you don't like the data in there, you can actually add your own. Like you can look up Botno County or Billings County or Bowman County and add data to that. Like what is their median income and things like that. And especially if you're just using a small end like just the hospitals in um, Massachusetts, that's not that big. You can look up a bunch of stuff about each of the hospitals and just create your own Excel data set. And, um, and again, you have to keep track of everything you did or else um, it won't be replicable. But, um, but that's data abstraction. And the reason why I'm a big fan of data abstraction is because I'm a big fan of measurement and I'm a big fan of um, human brains and not artificial intelligence. Because when you sit down and you create structured data collection that has to do with some research aim, you're probably gonna do just a really good job of analyzing it. I mean, I like I give that um, example of that casino paper I did with, I hardly had any data and I could come up with some sort of reasonable comparisons between these casinos. And I'm not like this huge casino expert. And it all really had to do with, um, they had just a little bit of data online and it was like in a PDF. I had to like, it wasn't a table, but it was like a PDF and I, I just did data entry. And then I also looked up other stuff about the casino online, like what square feet it had and stuff. And um, so I'm a huge fan of data abstract abstraction and data entry and all that, but I'm the only one in the whole world, I'm pretty sure, um, because what everybody else likes to do is scrape the data. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to data scraping. And just to be clear what I mean by data scraping um, is this, I'll show you an example. So you can probably imagine that all I do is think about all these projects I wish I could do and I never have time because I'm, I don't know, or maybe I just don't have the political will. But um, I was thinking, what if I went, I live in Boston, but I grew up in Minneapolis. What if I went to Minneapolis um, and I stayed in a hotel instead of staying um, with my relatives, right? Um, I don't know, I just thought of that. Uh, I think I was asking that because I had to go when my dad was gonna be out of town or something, but I don't know, I once had this question and I searched for Minneapolis hotels on TripAdvisor thinking that I would get um, some good ideas. But what I realized is I had a lot of trouble comparing them because I actually kind of knew them, right? Like here, I'm sorry, I keep getting this. Try later. Um, so here's this Holiday Inn Express and Suites in downtown Minneapolis. And I, I don't actually 
I can't remember exactly where this is, but it's like got four dots and I kind of have a recollection. This is not that great of a hotel. I'd never heard of this Hewing hotel. Um, and I, let's see here. There was one that came up. It was this Normandy here. This one, those best. And I remembered this one, right? <laughs> You're going to laugh while I remember it. I remember it because in the movie Fargo, it's the uh, murder takes place in the parking lot of this uh, building. But anyway, so I remember this Normandy Suites and I'm like, this is kind of an old hotel. Like if you kind of look at it, it's got, it, it's, I, I think it's kind of cool looking. I like that. Um, but I, I was like, well, well, this is like four and a half best Western. Is this really that good? Well, if you look here, this is the overall rating is 4.5. But each of these has its own, like 4.5, 4.6, 4.5, 4.3. And I've always sort of wondered how do they combine this to make this? And I'm assuming it's sort of weighted, you know, because each person down here, I guess you can read this. But my point is this sort of cool old fashioned sort of 60s looking hotel that's apparently pretty high rated um it, it's four and a half dots and so is like you know like this hewing hotel which is totally new right and i don't know anything about it so i was like well the problem with all this is is that i i kind of wish i could compare these these things right like this value is low on this one like this is not good value where's that other one i think the other one was good value but you see how i had to like the value 4.3 but you see how i have to toggle back and forth to um to do all that and it's annoying and what if i wanted what if i had the the hotels like you'll notice these are in downtown minneapolis like downtown minneapolis is like a grid and so I could draw on that grid exactly where I wanted this hotel to be. And so I could like scrape the data. So I could set up a situation because what you'll notice is that this is a standardized page. How this is displaying is there's a database behind it. And like Hewing Hotel is in the, in the header and it knows to put it here. And it knows to put this four and a half, um, this image of four and a half dots here. Um, like it runs, uh, it's got some value and it runs some sort of routine to know which image to display there. And and it, 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 it basically creates all these labels and places them based on the underlying data. OK, so, of course, if you're like me, I wish I could just break into TripAdvisor's database and just download the data right but you can't so then you're thinking of scraping it right and when you scrape stuff which i haven't done but i i worked on a project with natasha where she did the scraping um basically what you have to do is you have to first of all you cannot scrape unless you have a situation like this you're basically reverse engineering a, a database report so this this report you know when i clicked on like, let's say I click on this Ivy Hotel, which I think was under construction when I was there. I, I don't remember. It's been so long. But let's say here that I do this Ivy. Oh, I guess it's a collection here. I have to click, click on it. So let me see if I can find this, um, that list of, well, no, now I'm on Expedia. See, this is a problem. So uh, you pick this property on TripAdvisor. Okay. So I, I don't want to be on Expedia because if I go on Expedia, it's going to put all the, it's going to be different. It's going to have different, um, like, like a different location for all these things. Let's see here. So this is not, so this says Expedia, view deal Expedia. Oh, I, I, maybe I should have just clicked here. Like, I don't even know how to use this website, I guess. Well, that's it. I clicked in the wrong place. Well, that just shows you I obviously don't know what I'm doing. So here, so we would have to probably what would have to happen is I would have to open all of these pages and I would have to program whatever the scraping thing is to tell it what to scrape, like to tell it to scrape this, maybe scrape this. And you see, it's going to be hard to scrape like an image, right? 
let's see here. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm right clicking and saying open image a new tab. Oh, it's not. So a lot of times um, uh, web pages like this that are very professional will lock their images down. So this could be then a problem. Let's say that I wanted to scrape this. I probably could get this scraped and I could probably do that. But as you can see, it is really hard to reverse engineer a report, a database report displaying to the web to scrape the data out of it, okay? But there are reasons to do it. Now, if I were to do what I was just describing, like scrape some data from TripAdvisor so I can compare some Minneapolis hotels, and I made a little portfolio project about it, probably TripAdvisor wouldn't have any problems with that. But if I went and I scraped their whole database and I started offering it, like you can buy TripAdvisor's database from me, they probably care about that. So you have to, right now we're at a point where it's kind of like, it's not really clear what the rules are for scraping data. Because the other thing that could happen is I could just look these up. Let's say I look up 10 of them and do data entry. Is that illegal? I mean, no, probably not, right? Uh, you know, I mean, when you think about it, all of the data that TripAdvisor is putting in there is, is publicly available, you know, how many rooms they have when it, it was built. So you start asking the question is, when is it that I put together public data and it's unethical, right? Like I'm basically stealing someone else's data. Or if you think about the situation I just described where you're abstracting data according to some protocol, you're basically creating a data set if you did that. Like you could sell that if you, yeah, I mean, people do. Like there are research organizations that all they do is stuff like that, where they basically say, I'm going to collect data about all the new like course management system platforms like like you know um and the reason why we don't hear about those places a lot is you can't you have to pay them for their report right like i was reading i was helping a customer with something and we were reading oh this was it it was it was that insulin thing I, there was a report out about how people in north dakota were you know, it was some calculation about how they couldn't get their insulin who, who needed it. And then when I went to read, I was like, oh, this is a peer reviewed article. Well, it wasn't, it was a market, re it was a market report that had been commissioned. So it's not a peer reviewed article, you can't get it. But that's what those companies do. And they'll, they'll collect data from public domain and put it together and then sell it, right? And that's legal, I mean, that's a, it's a business. But if you go to steal TripAdvisor's data by back engineering their entire database, that's bad. Now, remember the thing that I told you about, um, about open government data, that we make these laws, that the government's supposed to put together this data that we all can download and we all can analyze. And they usually comply, but sometimes they sort of comply in a way that is very hard to use, right? And that's actually what spurred this um, project that um, Natasha and I did. So this is um, a dashboard Natasha made from data we scraped. So you might be like, oh, is that illegal? Well, actually it's not because the data we scraped is from the national, we believe it's from the national health um, NHSN, which is our data. It's the data of, the United States, the uh, NHSN, um, the National Health and Safety Network. Safety Network. This data, it's kind of like CMS and stuff like we were just looking at, right? But unlike, like I can't download the data, like they don't let you download it, okay? And remember, this is about healthcare facilities. It's not even about like individuals. Like, like people, so you would have to worry about redacting it. No, it's about healthcare facilities. It's not even about all of them. It's about the ones that report. And so I learned that there was a law in Massachusetts that they had to make this data available. They had to make nosocomial infection data available. So I guess people like me could shop around and try to stay alive by choosing uh, the safest hospital. But what ended up happening is 
they said, okay, well, first of all, I can't download this data from the feds here. So if I want to download it from Massachusetts, so I'm trying to see that here is these healthcare infection reports. So you go here and this was, I think, um, So here, see this HAI interactive map? So this, this is a PowerPoint and this is a document. So that's not an Excel, right? So that's not the data. There's no, you know, the data is not here, the data is not here. So we go to this interactive map and we have this. And I sat with this for a very long time and tried to figure out what it meant. Like, as you can see, there's just not many hospitals in Massachusetts. And if you stratify them and you, you say these kind of things, this doesn't tell me anything. Like, I have no idea how to compare these. And see, they separated all these. You know, this is Clab C, this is Cowdy. There's no way to tell anything. There's no way to compare these. And so, um, so here, now you can compare them. Like, we just... We, I don't know, we just looked at uh, just the, basically the raw rates and we we're missing a lot of data. So this isn't very accurate because the NHSN is just really inaccurate. But this at least lets you compare, do some sort of comparison. And I would have preferred to have the raw data and do a better job of saying which ones were lacking data or whatever. But this is what you can do when you scrape data. But I felt okay scraping the data because it's our data, it's NHSN. And so that was totally annoying. Um, so the problem with um, scraping data is it can be logistically challenging. And like I said, it can be um, illegal. Like if you go to um, ahd.com, this is a really good data base. It, it's American Hospital Directory and it's, it's a for-profit company. And what they do, so it's every um, quarter, hospitals that receive payment from Medicare have to submit quarterly data uh, to the government and about the hospital. And you can buy that data from the government raw, or you can pay hd.com and, and be able to log in and they've got that all set up in um, like, like you can, you can, download the data and analyze this all hooked up together. It's really nice. The reason why I haven't ever really gotten into this is because it's mostly used for like people doing cost analysis, because that's what's really good in there is looking at costs of like procedures across the US. But they allow you, they, they have this free state and national stats. And when I was teaching my statistics class, I often used this data, you know, so first of all, you know, I know the data about hospitals is public data, like that. there's nothing private in here. But I would go in and I'd say, okay, here's Massachusetts. And I'd be teaching them, um, like for instance, I was teaching sampling. So I said, okay, why don't you do systematic sampling of this? Well, you know, if, if I take information like this, from American Hospital Directory, from some 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 of these hospitals, and I look at it like if you look at each of these, um, like here, Bay State Noble Hospital in Westfield, you'll see it's it's a one of these um, reports, right? And it's got all this. You know, this is just not something you should scrape, right? And they also say it's illegal. Like if they find that you're scraping their data set, they'll shut you down. But I really just don't think that they'd get mad if at my statistics class, which would go in and ask a few questions and look at a little bit of data about the hospitals they're familiar with. And so right now there's not like, like I don't know what the line is. I don't know if I looked up a bunch of data on there if they'd get mad. I know if you do a bunch of queries in there, they'll shut you down. They'll say you're not allowed to do any queries for a little while. But this is sort of a gray area right now in um when it comes to um to like when when do you, when can you get away with scraping and when can you not get away with scraping because you know um the NHSN is the government if it wasn't 
it would be like, okay, the NHSN did all this work to put this data together and now we're scraping and stealing it. So that's the whole idea. All right. So let's see here. And so, um, so let's just try to think of some structured data that might be displayed on the internet that could help you with your topic. And Mika, you know, we can talk about this because there is a lot of data on the internet about drug policy. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like, like, for example, you know, actually, let's just, let's just talk about, like, see if there's any sort of database of like, um, so one of the things that we had been talking about is fraud. And I was thinking, you know, there are actual, like fraud happens and, and places are adjudicated that they did fraud, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe there are like there's some data collection that can happen about fraud cases, right? Like pharmacy fraud cases. Um, just so we better understand like what is actually happening out there in pharmacy fraud. So let's see here, pharmacy fraud cases in the United States. And let me just see here. Um, so here, HHS sometimes will have, let's see here. Yeah, see this fraud enforcement actions. I remember this from NIH. NIH had like these notice, or it still has this notice of scientific misconduct, NOT. It's a note, a specific type of notice. And so, if you want to study scientific misconduct, you usually collect all those notices together. So let me see here. This is enforcement actions. Okay. Yeah. So here's our enforcement actions. Let's look at. Um, Let's see here. Grand, I'm just curious about grant fraud self disclosures. Okay, well that's interesting. All right, let's see if we do. Um, th these are self disclosures. You know, ah, huh. child support. Yeah. And affirmative exclusions. God, I don't even know. So this is another thing. Like, where's all? The, where's the information about what this even means? Right? Like, where am I going to look? You know, is it is it this stipulated penalties? Yeah, here, like prosthetics. Like this might even be in here. You know, and I don't even have like. Um, there's no way to um, search. Like, let's see your farm. Yeah, key Medicare safe against problems. This isn't even on their server. Is this on their server? Oh, I guess do not apply to Part D. What does this say? Key Medicare tools to safeguard against pharmacy fraud and inappropriate billing do not apply to Part D. Does that make any sense to you? Like that sentence doesn't make sense to no. me. No, I was like, oh, what they are talking about? <laughs> I was like. <laughs> I remember when I was living in Tampa, Mika, there was a news article that said there was just a rule passed by the judge that says houses inspected by the city of Tampa after they're sold or as part of the selling and approved, that that doesn't mean that they're approved. <laughs> <laughs> Right, like that kind of reads like this, right? Um, so, Medicare part was paid 168 billion for drugs and for 46.8 million Medicare anniversaries in 2018. Despite its size, Part D does not have the same protections against pharmacy fraud that other parts of Medicare have. OIG has a long-standing concern about pharmacy-related fraud and inappropriate billing in Part D. This issue brief is another step in OIG's larger strategy to fight this fraud. Oh, so basically what this article is about is about the gaps in the law where fraud occurs so you can look for those gaps. Isn't that interesting? So I guess um, the answer is the reason why I didn't find any pharmacy here, or maybe we could find some if we look, but it's because it's really hard to do because there's just holes in the law. But unfortunately, let me see if there's a better database here. Like, because sometimes 
So I, I'm, I'm going to show you this totally unrelated database just because um, it's a great example. Okay, so I've been following this database since like for 20 years now, since Iraq was invaded by the US. So Iraq body count was started by these people who started to notice if, if you if you remember the beginning of the invasion, I remember it because I was very against it. Um, the, the press was not really allowed there. So we knew what was going on with the military, where our own military, but we really didn't know how many people were getting killed. And so this group of people started this where they would review the news for, and they would try to categorize how many people like died from news reports, from public reports. I mean, this is super sophisticated now, right? And the problem, this has been written about extensively now, you know, can you do the citizen data collection? You know, can you, can you really get data from reports? Can you really do this kind of epidemiology from, you know, media? And the answer is pretty much, it's kind of better than nothing. It's, that's about it. It's better than nothing. It's not really great, but it's better than nothing. And so um, what I feel like has happened, and I've seen this more recently, like I said, this is a 20 year old project. I've seen more of these kind of things popping up because it's just easier to make a Google like, like um, Excel sheet and share it and stuff and people can, you know, record on it. Um, but people have started doing things where they'll keep a database of things like that. Like, I can't remember the exact news article, but there were some women at a workplace that were keeping a database of the guys who sexually harassed them, you know, and were adding data to it <laughs> and help. And so, um, and so you can, you know, I was thinking maybe there are people on like citizen data scientists who are collecting data about pharmacy fraud or about fraud on there. And you might find something like that. But again, that's kind of in this category of like, um, of make your own data to some degree, or maybe more like hustling around and looking for, um, you know, like you, you don't even know what you're gonna find. Like I found this one, um, Tesla death, death database. Like there's this Tesla death database here. <laughs> Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. Isn't that fun? <laughs> oh, wow. So that's what I'm saying is, and so, okay. So let's say like, what's awesome because you found some data that I think is going to work for you. But let's say that you did. You can always like, let's say that you found a database, like instead of this was Tesla deaths, this was like overdose deaths or something like that. Maybe you could just use, maybe if the data is so clean and so easy, maybe you can just use it for a quick project that relates to what you're doing, you know, just because, so what will happen is this is about going down the rabbit hole. It's sometimes, this is why it's good to keep your requirements in mind is because sometimes you might just say, hey, I found this data set. Like, let's say I found a data set that was about pharmacies running out of insulin. Okay. That's good enough. <laughs> I'll analyze my data set of pharmacies running out of insulin. You know what I mean? And so you kind of mm -hmm. have to get pragmatic about it, but you don't have to, Mika, because you found really good data. I, I say that, but there's always the possibility that you download the data and it doesn't work. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you come up with a plan, you're going to analyze some um, California data, whatever. And then when you download it and you look, you're let's say you're looking for some drugs that you know people take in, in California, like hypertension drugs, like drugs that are really popular and they're not in there. And you see a lot of weird drugs in there, like a lot of vancomycin or Valium, like old drugs that people don't use. Then you just go, okay, I'm gonna just back away from the same set, you know? Like I remember, um, so Florida has a, a, an agency called ACA, the Agency for Healthcare, I don't know what it is. And they they collect a lot of data, um, claims data. And an um, associate of mine wrote a protocol. He got some of that data. And the data he pulled happened to be claims for surgeries because he did surgeries. 
And there was a complications flag on the claim. It would be a one or a zero. And he insisted that this was such a good data point. And I said, on, on claims, I don't think you, I would trust a complications flag for like surgical complication. And he's like, no, trust it. And what I did was I found there were some there, I found claims where there were, it was clear there was a complication in the surgery because it was some procedure. I, I worked with him. I'm like, okay, what would a claim look like if you had a complication? And so we found some claims that we were sure there were complications and that flag wasn't on it. So I was like, okay, you cannot use this flag, right? And so um, so you just gotta be careful. Like, like, like it's ACA and it's good data and it's good claims data, but why would you trust a complication flag in claims data anyway, right? Like you just gotta be careful even if you get good data. Um, so let's see here. So I was towards the end here. So, um, so now we're at the end of our workshop here and I'm so happy Mika has data. Um, so just in conclusion, there are three main ways, you know, in 2023, I guess if I do this in a year, they'll be different, but there's three main ways to find data. So you can shop for data and look in official data repositories. I would, I would put the um, Kaggle data that people find in that category of one which is, remember, not that useful. Um, it, it's, it's useful if you wanna like practice displaying it on a dashboard or practice building reports. But if you really wanna just like find something out about the data, often um, repositories have data that everybody's already trampled all over. So usually what you find yourself doing is hustling for data, looking for data sets available on the internet, that are not part of a repository or like in Mika's case that are, are technically part of a government agency's repository, but they're buried. And so you, you are, if you're looking for government data, so what was smart about what Mika did was that she, was, she knew the government data existed and she knew it should be available and she just kept looking until she found it. And I've had that experience too, where I'll just look and look and look and look and look and look and then finally find it. And so if you have a job or you've had a job where you know about this, you know about certain data, you know it's on the internet, you just have to find it, then keep looking. But if you don't, then you also still have to keep looking because you just don't know what's out there. And every day people post stuff. And you know, we had a workshop on GitHub. I'm sure people post data on GitHub. The problem is GitHub is not like an official like data repository so it doesn't force you to put documentation and all that on there um and so who knows what you're using um in the end i like to make my own data and you can do that um but you have to be careful if you're going to scrape it there are ethical considerations and legal considerations and if you're going to just collect data off of the internet um that's abstraction and so you really want to be careful um that you can replicate it and that you have a good method so that you can analyze it and interpret it when you're done. And then I'll, we'll, we'll end the workshop and I'll post this for Beth and Saqib and hopefully then they can go shopping for data just like we did. So good job um, with your data detection. You're a great data detective. So like Encyclopedia Brown, you got your, <laughs> uh, you got your data. So great job. All right. Well, thanks for showing up today and I hope you have a good weekend. Thank you for watching this video, which is part of the Public Health to Data Science rebrand program. If you are interested in joining the program, please sign up for a 30 minute Zoom interview using the link in the description.